I'm sure you all are ready for our incredible educator panel that is coming up next. Hello, I am Laura Koenig, Senior Director of Blueprint and Transformational Change. And I'm here to introduce this incredible educator panel. We know at the center of this work today, we have been talking about students and we keep that human focus as we move forward. No one is closer to our students and creating that sense of belonging with them than our teachers and educators who are on campuses every day. Woohoo! Yes! <laughs> Today we have an outstanding panel of uh, emerging educators and master teachers and also support for them from the campus of educators who are here to share with you the experience of what it is like post-pandemic or through the pandemic. And with us, we have our own Amy Havard, uh, Director of School Transformation at E3 Alliance, who will be guiding this conversation today. And we are hoping that it sparks a lot of, uh, a lot of change in you and hearing all of this information. And there'll be time, hopefully, for you all to also be able to ask questions of this incredible panel today. And I'm going to hand my mic. We're going to be passing it back and forth between the panelists and hand it over to Amy. Hello, I'm Dana Phillips. I just started my 26th year in the classroom and I teach at Clint Small Middle School. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jada Ransom. I am a teacher at Crockett High School. I'm in my third year teaching. I was um, 25 years ELAR, and um, this is my first year of all um, electives. So I teach photojournalism. I teach creative writing, and I teach an avid Excel course. Um, I also teach math there at Crockett High School, specifically geometry, and then algebra two on ramps. Hi, um, I'm Ocean Ekmark. I'm one of the two uh, student teachers from UTeach, and I teach at McCallum High School, um, social studies. Hello, I'm Gavin Desitel. I'm also with UTeach, Social Studies at Anderson High School. Hello, I am Sarah Otto, and I am the principal at LaGrange Middle School. This is my 14th year as a principal, and I just realized that my seventh grade science teacher is sitting in the audience today. So I'm a little bit more nervous than I anticipated, but I'm super, and I just want to point out, I did teach science, middle school science, so when we talk about retention and all those things in just a second, it really does work, because it brightened my day. So. Glad to be here. Thank you for having us. All right, all right. Um, so we are uh, we're going to just go ahead and jump straight into some questions that um, you know we tried to brainstorm. What are some things that we think that you guys would want to hear um, about their experiences, and then also kind of asking them to share some of the things that, as uh, Laura said, that they've really kind of learned from their experience over the last few years. So our first question is kind of uh, what's on everybody's minds. So how do you guys see your students showing up differently in your schools, in your classrooms over the last few years after their experience during the pandemic? So, so what do you see students um, bringing to the classroom that might be different? Right, I'll go ahead and start. Um, uh, I would say straight after the pandemic, what happened was just ability to focus had sharply fallen to stay engaged for more than five to seven minutes. Um, that, you know, we knew in a middle school cycle of teaching, you have to change um, what you're doing every 12, 15 minutes, but that shortened. And uh, after that, I would say um, their attention towards one another. We, in middle school, again, we know social creatures, but it became uh, extremely important to be near each other, to touch each other, to, you know, there was so much of that in one respect. The opposite respect was the students who were full of anxiety 
not making it to class. We had multiple students last year, and I didn't mention this, but wouldn't get out of the car in the morning. Um, would really, we'd have to work very closely with those families just to get students in the building. And then even this year, I have two young ladies who may or may not end up being um, working th at home. They're just not making it into the classrooms. Um, just the mental health. <laughs> And 504, the, the amount of 504 uh, accommodations coming through. I was showing a pre-service teacher in my class the other day, you know, just making a spreadsheet. Here are the names, here are the different accommodations, and you know, each class has 15, and in a class, we have large classes this year, 35 to 37 kids in the classroom, and 20 of them have accommodations for 504. That has nothing to do with SPED or anything else, GT or, you know. So just to Ellis. clarify, that, yeah. that's probably a, a mental health or some type of other diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, there's kind of a twofold. Parents are hyper-focused on why their children are excelling or not excelling. And so maybe you're getting diagnoses that you wouldn't have mm -hmm. even considered in the past. They're gonna kind of struggle through. So I think there's part of that, just this hyper-attention mm -hmm. to why is my child not per performing? Mm -hmm. And then also, yes, there's anxiety. The 504 for anxiety is, is just a lot more than we've ever seen before, at least in my 26 years of experience. Sure. Thank you. And Jada, um, as a, a newer teacher, um, I think you said three years, is that correct? So, so what have you seen that students might be bringing to your classroom? Yeah, no, Dana was spot on. So attention spans are just, They've decreased, um, having to take a lot of breaks during the lesson time. Um, and then just kind of seeing how my students have troubles socially interacting with other students, um, even with me being comfortable. So um, I spend a lot of time really trying to foster an environment for my students that, because they are struggling a lot with mental health, social anxiety, um, just wanting to show up, uh, show up to school and show up to learn. So showing up to school is one thing, but showing up to learn is another. Um, they're just really, and then technology has, has also been a battle to um, using it as a learning tool rather than whatever they're used to. And then um, they're not used to seeing, being in a position to where they have to collaborate to. So like that transition was pretty hard as well. Um, so collaboration, social anxiety, increase in 504s, um, and then the number of accommodations that I have in my classroom and trying to keep up with those things. Um, it can be overwhelming for both the student and for the teacher. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anybody else? You good? All right, we'll move on to our next question. Um, what are some ways in which you guys have adapted your practice in the last few years to meet some of the needs that you've expressed or, or other things that you see as a need um, since the pandemic? I'm actually going to start with Sarah. So my job and my lens is to take care of my teachers so that they can take care of kids. And that is probably one of the biggest things that I as administrator have adapted to thinking first as opposed to, uh, we always say kids first, right? Um, but if now our teachers are not capable and able to take care of themselves, then there's no way they're gonna be able to take care of kids first. And so my lens when something does go, go wrong, the first thing is, are you okay? Um, how, how can I help you through this so that we can work together to help our kids? One of the things that we've adapted on our campus, and I piggyback exactly on what these two wonderful teachers said, is that our kids are lacking the ability to connect face-to-face, human-to-human. And so we developed, it's literally 12 minutes of their day, but it's every day at the end of fifth period, and they are off their phones. We, I'm, I'm middle school, so I got a lot of looks, but we bought play equipment, we bought Play-Doh, we bought Legos, we bought board games, we bought, uh, uh, <laughs> one of my teachers bought this really awesome Nerf basketball thing. They get out in the hallways, uh, beach balls, they kind of play with each other, and we play, we connect, we call it connections. And it is, it's a play break for, you know. Yeah. Yes, and we eat a snack also during that time, so when you talk about taking care, and then my teachers, their job at that moment too is get out from behind your desk and go connect with your kids and, and connect with each other. So like if we're gonna maybe bring our classes together to go do something outside or bring our classes together in the hallway, we're gonna match up and play some mean, some mean beach, beach volleyball today in the hallway. You know, it's just, it's just a nice way to have a little bit of a break because even as adults, like if you think about our day today, we had breaks. 
we don't always think that for children. We think, no, you should just go to school for eight hours and your four minute passing period or five minute passing period is your break. And children need that too, just as much as we do as adult learners. Um, one of the things that we, my leadership team, and I'm very lucky, I do have a small campus, but man, you walk onto that campus and it's all about culture. It's all about the culture when you walk through the door and the culture when the kids walk through each classroom. Um, but doing a lot of calibration with that, and my leadership team really worked hard this year to set out those expectations for what each classroom, what our, our ideal classroom expectations should look like, so that even our new teachers, when they were onboarding, they felt like this affirmation, like, okay, I can do this, ensuring that their physical plan is, is, is ensuring student excellence, um, ensuring that their expectations and their routines in their classroom. And we called it our leadership playbook because we know more than ever that we, you know, that character education and leadership education for kids and for teachers is, is more important than ever. So we wanted to make sure that we developed something that would take off all of that anxiety and be consistent across our campus. So we call it our leadership playbook. And we've had a lot of success on that and are very excited we're launching that. So this is, you know, fourth week of school. <laughs> But we are, are very, very excited about utilizing that. So awesome. it's been really, it's been, it's been a lot better than I anticipated. And I'm not as getting many, as many looks this year about, <laughs> about connections for middle school kids. Because I think everybody is understanding the why of those relationships and understanding the why, even with families, um, why, do we, why do we ask that you connect with them? So yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And Ocean, I know you had something to add as well. Yeah. So um, the pandemic definitely affected you know everybody a lot um i i think as well as gavin we were both class of 2020 for high school so if you think back to then that was like the year that no one had prom like graduation everybody was masked i think we could only have two guests like it was a whole thing and i actually graduated high school a year early so that was also my first semester um of community college so it was really rocky just all around and i like to think back to biology class and in chem and we were like do y'all think COVID's real? Like, no way, like, you know, like, what? Well, we're not gonna have like a week off of class. And then, you know, next thing you know, you have a whole year off. And then next thing you know, I'm like finishing. And then I'm like going to university. So here I'm at UT and I was just trying to like find, yeah, ways that I could like get the most of my degree while also being in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and also being kind to myself. Um, and I found that through you teach like this program and what I have gained from like, you know, my teachers and like my peers is just something I never would have experienced. And like now um, I like to go into the classrooms with a lens of how can I make this first? Like how can I respect the kids and then have them respect me and then also like see it as like like an empathy lens because going back to like the 504 and the accommodations, like to get vulnerable, I am also a student who has accommodations at UT um, and I would not have been able to make it through my degree without that. Um, I am extremely ambitious and I don't like want any of that to stand in my way. Um, if anything, that's just something that lifts me up. So that's something that I really want to like encourage my students to be vulnerable with me and let them know that like I'm a human, I see you as a human because I was, I was only in high school a few years ago hearing all of my teachers tell me all of these things I wouldn't be able to do. And you know, as a young like person of color, I'm from East Texas in the, like, the most rural place ever. Um, everybody's just telling you all these things that you aren't able to do. And it's like now I'm doing them and I don't see that lens when I speak to young children. Like I see all of their potential, like all of their possibilities in life because you know, I didn't really have that many people before coming to UT, like telling me all of these things I could do. But now, I mean, I have mentors like left and right, which is like such a blessing. And I'm so like grateful for that experience um, that I have found through UT because from here, I've been able to like find my passions and also take on a new lens when it comes to approaching students um, past pandemic, like with more of like respect and like, yeah, just, empathy which i feel like they don't get like when i was a kid my the most frustrating thing to me was people not respecting me i was like why are you not listening you know and like when i go into the classrooms now like these kids are so extremely smart like it's insane um 
My very first semester at UTH, I did elementary school. I like older kids, elementary schoolers scare me. <laughs> like, and it was math, like my subject area is social studies, so it was like a whole thing, and they were GT students. So these were like the smartest little fifth grade math kids I've ever known, and I was like, whoa, this is my first semester like in a classroom. And I mean, that just taught me like, wow, like I have so much to learn from them. Like, Every day I go into the classroom, like I want the questions, like I want the experience, I want, you know, all of it because that's what makes them feel more free and included in the space rather than, you know, rigid, like this is what I know and like this is what we're gonna do. Like, no, kids don't want that. Cause yeah, showing up is hard enough. I mean, gosh, they have to wake up early, then they have to like, you know, think about social stuff and their friends, where to sit at lunch, like what they're gonna do on this test, like extracurriculars, I mean, I cheered for seven years, so that was like a whole other thing, you know? You wake up at 6 a.m., you have practice at 5 a.m., and then you like cheer till like 10 o'clock at night, and then you have to come home and do your homework, and that's like every single day. And yeah, I think what everybody's saying, just finding ways to like take breaks in between that is like extremely important for both ourselves and for the students. Definitely. Yeah, thank you. And I just, um, I know that's something Gavin and um, Jada were also, you guys also mentioned that you were students during the pandemic, so I know I'm switching up a little bit, but um, will, Gavin, will you talk about maybe, you know, similar to Ocean's experience, what is it like to now be in a classroom, leading a classroom, knowing what it felt like to be a student during the pandemic? How, how is that shaping how you approach your students? So, so uh, definitely. Um, during the pandemic hit during my senior year, so um, there was no prom and uh, no of the usual graduation stuff. So it, it was definitely a, a weird time for me, you know, having you know all this time looking forward to the high school experience, and then here I am in Austin at the University of Texas with uh, all my classes online. So um, you know, it was definitely a jarring experience. But I think one of the main takeaways that I took out of it was the of the sheer importance that community is. Um, as uh, college students, as high schoolers, I think every student feels the need to find their niche and fit in somewhere. And um, you know, in that respect, I think one of the most important values you can foster in your classroom is community. You know, I think real learning will only take place once students feel comfortable enough to be themselves, to show their, show their vulnerabilities and you know, part of learning is failing and learning from those mistakes. So I think coming out of COVID, uh, one of the most important values that we as educators can stress is just building that shared sense of community. I think it's really important, especially uh, coming out of the pandemic. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, and Jada, yes, thank you. And Jada, I know you, um, you've been teaching for about three years. So you ended your college career during the pandemic and then immediately had to go into the front of a classroom you know, as we were doing virtual learning. So we talk a little bit about how that shaped how you're approaching you know, the student to teacher during the pandemic. I mean, um, it was definitely a unique experience just being a, a college student, not being able to watch, walk the stage. Um, and so, there's something that I could relate to the kids about, like having to try to learn something online. Um, and that was, that's the biggest thing. Like I'm very empathetic and patient with my kids because I was one in that position and two, it's, it's a hard thing to do, it is. It's a hard thing to do, especially with the kids. And then I was a 21 year old trying to do that too. So I could only imagine like what it was for them. Um, elementary kids, middle school kids, high school kids. Um, and you just kind of take what you've learned and you learn from your experiences and I just kind of apply it to my classroom. So it really got me through those times and what I apply to my classroom is just, um, like Gavin said, a sense of community. So really fostering an environment where students were open to failure, were open to learning, and then were open to embracing those obstacles that might happen. Um, and it's just like the, I, we talk about the pandemic, there's a lot of skills that are missing and like teaching math, some kids are like, oh my gosh, Miss Ransom, I cannot stand math, but I love your class, I love your class. And so that's just like, that's the one thing that I really enjoy because like when you're online, you're just all alone. So like coming in person and having this set of students and teachers and just a facilitator in the classroom that just really helps shape their minds beyond math, science, reading. So 
Um, we focus a lot in social emotional learning in our school and I, I appreciate that because it's something that was needed during the pandemic too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And oh, sorry, yes, Dana, you totally can. I just wanted to add something. So in AISD, <clears throat> SEL has been something we've been doing for sure. more than a decade, right? So, and, but, but part of what was missing is that it never seemed authentic. And we always were, you know, were these, these lessons that were just kind of, everybody was doing the same lesson, and I was part of that. I, I loved, I, I thought that was great. I'd never done anything like that before. Then the pandemic hits, and it's all authentic. Every social emotional lesson that you're engaging in is happening in real time with children, and it makes me think about what you were saying, Sarah, about you show up because if you don't attend now, you don't know what's going to happen. It's not a, you know, they'll just get through it kind of situation. Now we attend to every need as it comes up. Um, and then teaching other children, al along with adults, how to meet the needs of the people in your community. So uh, I I'm thrilled about it, but I'm also really glad that we're talking about the toll that it takes on teachers in our schools um, along with the children. So thank you. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I just, uh, Jada, you said something to me the other day when we were talking about, you know, what you guys are just saying, and I believe what you said was, you know, we have to think, don't blame the students for something they can't control, right? Like none of us can control the way the school went over the last few years. And so knowing that they're coming to you with those <laughs> needs and knowing that you know, Sarah's expressed, and you, Dana, that teachers are also coming with those needs. And so I just, I, that stuck in my brain, you guys. Um, so I wanted to bring that out. But um, kind of thinking, Dana, thank you for saying that. This kind of takes us into our next question. So we know that a lot of people are really concerned with the number of teachers who have been leaving the profession. It's been a problem well before, um, but it is definitely seems to have been exacerbated over the last few years. So my question for you guys is, obviously we have some very experienced principal teacher and we have some people who are just starting to move into the profession. Um, what is it that makes you or maybe other teachers um, around you feel supported, feel connected? to your work, to the community that you're a part of? Um, what is it that makes you want to stay? And I'm going to start with Jada. Um, <laughs> I feel like sometimes I battle with this question, honestly, honestly. Um, because there are, there are some things that I struggle with, and I'm just starting my third year. But what really keeps me going is just like the passion that I want to have for what I'm doing, the craft that I'm doing. And then too, just the community that my school has. So like the community is not just in the classroom, it's, the, it's also within the teachers. So um, we're very much so well acquainted with each other. Um, it's not, oh, who's that teacher down the hallway? We, we know each other by name, just how we wish to know our students by their names and their needs. Um, the same thing goes for our teachers too. So just having that support um, with my admin, um, my department chair, and then the people that are in my department, that's, that's really, really helped me in this profession. Um, it's a community effort. I tell that to the parents, I tell that to my students, and then we all talk about it at school. So, um, and I mean, passion is really keeping me going. I believe in the work that we do as educators, and it's supposed to be some really good work despite any of the obstacles and challenges that we go through. So, um, I'm, I'm very, very passionate about what we do here. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. And Dana? Sorry, you get to hear me again. Um, I, uh, it's the same. I, I feel like the teachers, so I'm almost ready to retire. I can retire next year if I want to. Um, and so uh, I meet my rule of 80, and I'm thinking about what that looks like and if, if I want to continue in the classroom or retire. Um, but watching the younger teachers around me, teachers, you know, have 15 years in or whatever, when the, after the pandemic, lots of conversations about, is this too hard on my own mental health to stay in the profession? It's not that they didn't love the profession or didn't love the students, but there was definitely a concern about their own families, their own children, themselves. Um, I think um, forever, teaching has been kind of thought of as a tireless profession where you don't really get a lot of people kind of looking in to see what's happening. And more and more um, teachers are, you know, the, you can look outside and, and, um, and see that in a lot of places we're not respected. There's a lot going on in the news and um, the way that, that teachers are being talked to or just how education is being seen. 
um, and what we're supposedly doing to children. And that can be really, that, that can be very difficult depending on where you live, who you talk to, what your community is like. It takes a toll um, on people. Not only are you sticking up for kids in your classroom, but now you have to stick up for the profession outside of the classroom and say, that's not what I'm doing. That's not what's happening at my school. And, um, and so I think without this sense of community, which we've always known, that's how you get kids to learn, but now we need it with our adults in the building as well. So hearing you say that you know the teachers you know, in your building is making me think we have brand new teachers on our campus. I wanna make sure everybody knows their names when, they, when I get back um, to make sure that they're feeling cared about. And, and I hope Sarah talks about um, how she goes about making her teachers feel loved and cared for, because without that, um, you're gonna see more teachers leave. Um, yeah, if there's not a, a, that sense of, of me, myself, Dana Phillips, matters on this campus, sure. I, I feel like more teachers are gonna, gonna yeah. walk out. Thank you, and um, I do wanna ask Sarah just briefly, we have just a few more minutes, and I wanna ask Sarah um, to respond to that, because I think, yeah, you have a new, and then I'm gonna ask uh, Gavin and Ocean right and so, after that. It is just that, it is that easy. And I think sometimes we make it more difficult than it needs to be. Um, there is nothing more important than your family. There is nothing more important than the work that we do together. And so when you think in those terms, when you have a teacher that comes to you, hey, I need to leave like 10 minutes early today because I gotta take my kid to the doctor, or I gotta do this, or hey, can I go to the pep rally and watch my kids perform? The answer is always going to be yes, and we're always gonna figure a way out to do that. And why? Because that's what keeps us all going, is because we all wear lots of different hats, and to think that we live in these silos, that, that that's not how it works. Um, as a campus, we talk a lot about being better together, and what does that mean? And it means that we rely on each other, we rely on our department heads, we rely on um, our, our, our office team, that they, that they take care of our teachers and get them everything that they need. We also rely on our community. We reach out, like I know HEB's here. Our HEB in LaGrange is amazing. If we need anything, we just call or text. And it's, so we rely on all of, the, all of that community as well to come together and to support our teachers and to support our kids. Um, but it, it is very hard right now with the political landscape of public education to not feel negative and to not feel all of the, the heavy downerness that's, that's bombarding us with social media. So we have to get out there and we have to tell our story because the, the voices that are loud right now, they're not sitting in this room. They're not sitting on this panel. These are the people that like coming to work every day and we show up because we love children, we love community, and we love our profession. And so our voices have to be louder. I don't have a Facebook, a personal Facebook, but I do now. And I've made it my mission this year to get out there and tell our story because there's so much good stuff going on with my kids on my campus and with my teachers that that's how that narrative is going to change is because we are going to be the louder voices for public education. Okay. Um, and we, we are almost out of time, so just kind of in this vein, um, we do have Gavin and Ocean who are just starting their journey. They are making the choice to move into teaching right now, as you've heard them say. So I wanna just ask that same question of you guys, uh, a little bit different, it's not why do you stay, um, but we'll start with Gavin. Gavin, why are you making this choice? And then also, um, you guys shared with me, you know, this might not be a lifelong choice, this might be something you're doing because you're ambitious and, and this is the first step in a journey for you. So will you share kind of the why you're, you're choosing to join our profession and what do you see coming down the road? Well, I, uh, I think for me the reason why I chose to go into teaching is um, I, I grew up myself, I grew up in a small, pretty rural town in southeast Texas. And you know, to be honest, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for students uh, in my area. Um, you know, most students were expected to get their diploma and, you know, go into the oil field or something similar. And I think for me, my journey really started when um, I started dreaming bigger about the opportunities my small town can have. Um, during my freshman year of high school, I started the first ever computer science program at my high school. And I feel like that's really what ignited my passion for teaching, knowing that, you know, these towns and uh, you know, according to the TEA, uh, Texas has more rural schools than any other state in the country. 
So um, going into teaching, I have this rural framework uh, in mind. You know, there's so many schools that are so small, you never hear of them, they don't make the news, but you know, arguably, they're some of the most important schools in our state, and they're the ones that need the most amount of resources. And you know, going to teaching, I want to make a positive impact for those small communities, because you know, not Texas isn't just Dallas, it isn't just Houston or Austin. You know, there's so many communities, and I feel like, especially after the pandemic, we're so fractured right now. Um, I know that during my high school year, there's a lot of schools in my district, they couldn't afford to continue on with the school year. Some schools had early graduation, some schools struggled to give every student a computer, and it was, you know, it was a losing battle. So I think that, you know, all the things that we learned from this pandemic, if anything deserves our attention, and if any, you know, if anything should have uh, more resources, I really feel like that we need to point our attention to a lot of rural schools. And you know, that's where the, there needs to be more opportunities so students can, you know, if they decide to, go into a career in programming, go into a computer science field, a STEM field. Um, I just hate to see so many students um, settle for mediocrity when they can do so much more and achieve so much more. Thank you, Gavin. Yeah. Yeah. And we are going to close it out. Oh, thank you. We are going to close out before we move on to Q and A with Ocean. Will you tell us why and maybe what what your plan is long term? Yeah. So, <laughs> I actually okay. I do actually work at the Capitol right now. I'm an intern over there, and so between my two spots in UT and over there, um, I've kind of yeah found my passions along the along the way, and. In my work at the Capitol, um, I have an internship under Representative Bryant from District 114 in Dallas. So if anybody's from Dallas, um, I work with him. <laughs> he's great. Um, Y'all voted very well. Um, <laughs> he's like spearheading the Democratic Party. So actually something that we're focusing on is education and providing like mental health access for these students. So that is like what all of my work there is. Um, we all have like different areas, but you know, that's definitely one of the major issues that we're focusing on coming into the next legislative session. Um, so that honestly makes me very optimistic. And I would say what keeps me going in this field is, yeah, the idea that I think I can make a change and I think I can encourage others to make a change. And I think that I can um, influence students in a positive way that like Gavin was saying, also wants them to like make a change and they can see that in themselves because yeah I mean heavy on what Gavin was saying about these rural schools like only wanting you to get your high school like diploma and nothing else after that um, you know high or college and everything obviously is not for everybody but pe like students should be aware of their options um, they, they shouldn't just be thrown out the window because we don't have the resources or you know the teachers or anything like that um, the communication skills and so what I'm doing there is you know trying to find legislation trying to find ways researching different conferences and like ideas from teachers of how we can actually yeah implement all of these ideas and get those voices heard uh, because yeah in the future I definitely see myself pursuing this in some sort of like policy way, some sort of like lawmaking way, and actually getting my experience from you teach and what I do here to a place that matters, you know, in the White House, wherever that might be, that's <laughs> definitely, you know, where I like see myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly, as they say at UT, yeah, what starts here changes the world. So between my research, between my you teach experience, between my internship at the Capitol, you know, I definitely feel that me from small town in Porter, Texas, you know, can make a difference. So I don't see why like anybody else can't, and that's what I want to like encourage my students. Thank you, thank you. We have a we have a little Longhorn bias up here. I will say. Um, thank you, guys. We do want to make sure and honor if anybody out there has a question. So if you have a question, if you will stand up, Heather is going to kind of call on you. Take a mic over to you. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's nothing left to say. All right. Well, while you guys are thinking of a qu oh, do we have one? Yay. 
uh, to all of y'all. Um, what are the behaviors that you cultivate in the classroom to create a sense of belonging uh, for your students? Oh, very good question. Yeah. So Dana's going to start us off. Um, uh, thank you for that question. I think it's really important that we don't just talk about it, but then what does it actually look like in the classroom? So for me, um, it starts out really simply, um, we, I, I do talk about what it means to be an academic risk taker, but then we um, celebrate academic risk taking. And I do tell my students, we talk about what does it mean to feel safe in the classroom? And part of that is knowing each other, sharing with one another, me supporting. If, if, if a student were then, say, to turn around and make fun of another student, I'm talking about that immediately. That's a conversation that's happening now. Um, I think it's a sense of shared experiences around um, uh, making mistakes and celebrating mistake making. Um, so for me, it's, it's from day one coming in and that sense of we are here together, we know each other, what ha we even play the what happens in this room stays in this room kind of facilitation. Um, there's a, I'm a language arts teacher, so there's a lot of sharing in the classroom. There's a lot of vulnerable authenticity that happens around reading and writing, um, and, but it's immediate. That's an immediate, I, I bring it to the forefront right away. I want you to feel safe in here. I want you to understand that risk taking create, you have to feel safe before you can be risky. To be risky means that you're gonna make mistakes. So normalizing all of that through how I expect them to talk to each other, how I expect them to share with one another, and then also how I'm sharing with them. So what I expect them to do, I do it myself. Oh, Thank and you. apologize when you're wrong, even <laughs> as an adult. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so for me, I definitely like to emphasize just meeting them halfway. Like, whatever students can bring that day, that's great for me. Like, thank you for being here. Because um, what I found during the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic for me and my academia is literally getting to class is so hard. And then you have to like, yeah, pay attention. Like something that I, like a little mini experiment I did in class is I like to look around and you'll see every single student in class, their leg is tapping. And before the pandemic, you know, I never noticed that. And now everybody is filled with that, which we know is like, you know, anxiety, whatever. It could be a long list of things. And that's an indicator that people need breaks. They need to be met halfway. They need to be asked, like, how can I help you? Because a lot of people literally don't know. Like, and they also don't know how to come to the teachers or anything like that. So something as small as just creating, like, um, little sheets of how you can help them that they can just write down and collect you know at the beginning of every semester in different ways that they might be accommodated throughout the semester you know that is meeting them halfway and you know just letting them be like letting them because i don't think the problem is students don't want to learn i don't think that's a problem at all i think it's just hard now like they don't have the tools to really know what that means, but we know that they want to learn because they're there. You know, if anything, the pandemic has showed us that if they don't want to come, they're not going to come. Um, so, you know, the fact that they're there, I think that's great. Like, if you're able to produce a great lesson that day and everybody's so engaged and everybody learns, like, that's great, you know, but that shouldn't be the standard. I think the standard should be meeting them halfway and making sure that everybody's mental health is well to even learn. So, yeah. Awesome. And can I, I'm going to put Sarah on the spot just because I know she mentioned uh, making some changes this year on her campus. And so I believe you guys kind of solidified some student behaviors or a student profile that you guys are teaching as part of your character ed. So we actually became a leader in Meet Campus this year because um, we needed something concrete for our character education and leadership program. And that gave us some really great language. When you talk about meeting kids halfway, that's win win. And so we, we really direct teach all of those things for kids so that they, they can take those and run with them in, in their own opportunities individually and collaboratively together as a campus. Um, that also has really helped us with our teachers and understanding the why behind what you talk about, the authenticity of social emotional learning. And, and, and now more than ever, it becomes more real. Um, but there are basic things that are developed into our leadership playbook that, we, that we've crafted. Um, that says things like, you're gonna greet your kids at the door, very nominal, right, like, like very easy, and you're gonna know their name, and you're gonna greet them, and you're gonna check in with them physically, emotionally, shake their hand, high five, handshake, whatever it is, because once they come through your threshold, you may have to regulate a kid, right? Because they might not be coming to you with exactly everything they need that day to be ready to learn, because kids learn 
they thrive and they heal in the context of relationships. And a relationship is a very abstract concept. So if we can take it and make it concrete by doing those actionable steps that are very simple, even our subs are, are expected to do that. Um, we, we, I shared a story with a group that had a sub coming this morning and he's like a retired counselor. I'm like, man, he's, he is on it. He goes, but I don't know their names. I said, get out the name tents. Make, have them make name tents. And he was like, like mind blowing. Because now he's able to engage with them more authentically just by saying their name. And so I think that there, there's just a lot of love that has to be spread through what we do. And yes, your lessons are more important than ever with A through F, whatever accountability ratings we're gonna get. And whenever we get those, we don't know yet. In a month. But they're gonna be month. good if you keep the most important thing important. And that's relationships, and that's culture, and that's community, and that's all the things this wonderful panel said to you today. So thank you. All right. I, I think we have time for one more question. We have, uh, we have anybody who has one more question. That was a great question. Thank you for that one. Right, I'm trying to I'm trying to show good wait time. <laughs> All right, well I'm going to ask you guys a question, and we're just going to go straight down the row, rapid fire answer, right, to make sure that uh, we get to our breakouts on time. Let's yeah, send it over to Dana. Um, just you know, you guys have talked a lot about you know the power of community and making both teachers and students feel very valued as part of your community. So can you give me just one example? of a time that, that either an administrator, another teacher, or a student made you feel valued, made you feel like you, they respected what you were doing. Yeah, I had a, um, so just this year, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example from this year. I have a young girl, and we call it our pride class because we're the cougars, um, but it's our advisory class. And this young lady was on a trip with her family and um, during the first three weeks of school, and her dog died while she was gone. And when her mother sent her back to school the next day, the young lady asked um, her mom to email me so that I would know what was going on with her, that I could check in with her during the day, that I was a teacher in those first three weeks that made her feel seen and valued, which made me feel seen and valued um, for the work that, that we do on a daily basis. So thank you. Thank you. Jada? Yeah, um, so just really quick story. I had a student who came in every day, put his head down, didn't do anything. And I said, oh my god. Um, so, it, I mean, it was a, definitely a battle, a struggle, but we finally got there. I'm talking about God. He was so smart. He made a 100 in the class. We were great. Um, at the end of the school year, he left me, you know, he said, thanks for seeing me. And that was it. And so we came back after this summer, and he's like, oh, my gosh, Miss Anderson, I missed you so much. And we're just talking. And so, like, it's just those little moments with those kids that really just do it for me, and that's what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ocean? Yeah, so as cheesy as it might be, this is definitely probably that moment for me. Um, <laughs> I, like, huge shout out to everybody in the UT liberal arts department. Um, Professor Dilly, who's right here, lovely lady, <laughs> all of them, Professor Wynn, you know, Director Bowles, Professor Wilson, all of them, just for believing in me and thinking I could be here. Um, that's a huge moment, I think. Yeah, I've really found my place in UTeach, and I've really like enjoyed the impact I've made there. And it's really awesome to be able to sit up here and like represent that, and like have all of my professors like believe in me, and then like yeah, be in a room where everybody's like cheering for what I say. Like that's like really cool. So you know, this is like my first time doing that. So this is definitely like that moment for me where I just like feel like everybody is proud of me. I'm proud of myself, and yeah, it's just really cool. So awesome. thank you all. Awesome. <laughs> and Gavin. So um, during, uh, throughout high school, I had a um, English teacher. His name was Mr. Gunner. And um, I did a bunch of uh, extracurriculars, uh, academic and UIL with him. And um, you know, if the pandemic wasn't strange enough as it already was, um, during uh, my first year of college, my uh, mother di got diagnosed with cancer and uh, unfortunately passed away. But um, when I think, when I have doubt in becoming a teacher, I always think about my high school teacher being one of the first people to call me and just ask, are you okay? Do you need anything? And you know, it was from that moment on that it really solidified for me that this is the career path that was meant for me. Thank you. 
I know. Sorry, Sarah. Hard to follow. <laughs> She's like, oh, okay. So I received, we, we utilize Talking Points, and if you've ever used it, it's a wonderful app, and it translates for parents, kind of like Remind, just a little more characters. I got a message from a parent yesterday, and she said, hey, I just want to remind you of that time when I didn't know you and you didn't know me, and you were on middle school duty at the football game, and I was bringing my kids to look at the school for the first time, and I thought, I don't know if these kids are for us or if this school's for us or the community's for us. They said, and I saw you standing at the top telling the kids, be safe and walk, be safe and walk. <laughs> and I knew immediately this was gonna be the place for us. And she messaged me this yesterday and I just thought, I didn't even know I did that. And, and that, <laughs> you know, and it's so you, you, you talk about who's watching you who, and kids watching us and teachers watching us as administrators. And it's just, it's every day, every chance, every step. And that's why I told this panel this morning I went to my campus because they needed me. And so I was there. So, yeah. so thank you for having us again. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> All right, you guys. And I know Laura's probably going to say this, but um, these guys, you know, got subs, walked away from their regular lives, their schoolwork, their, their classrooms. So please, one more time, will you guys please thank them for being with us here today.